Chapter 27 Huzzah! The musicians played the last dance, and as the candles burned down to stubs, their warm amber glow gave way to a chilly, dark room. Matt rushed into the pantry just off the kitchen. He set down his tray, kicked off his shoes, and hurried out of his footman's disguise. He quickly got back into his own clothes, then slipped out at the side door, being careful not to be seen. Once outside, he broke into a run, keeping his hand in his pocket and his fingers tightly wrapped around the button. He was nearly home when he heard a muffled moan coming from the side of the road. He stopped and peered down at something that caught his eye in the bright moonlight. What was it? Was it an animal? Was it a bird? Matt couldn't tell. But whatever it was, it was alive and covered in feathers. Help me! Please help me! The voice cried out to him. The frightening-looking creature was a man. Matt knelt down beside him. I'll get someone to help you, Matt said. Where do you live? The man clutched Matt's hand with, a little, with the little strength he had left and held on tight. I live on Milk Street, and I need to get back to my family. They are in terrible danger. Matt took a closer look at the man covered in feathers. He had been beaten so badly it was hard to see who he was. Then Matt realized that the man was Master Hewson, but he didn't recognize Matt. You can lean on me, Matt told him. Do you think you can stand? Master Hewson seemed to be fading out of consciousness. Matt tried to prop him up, but his body had become a dead weight, and he wouldn't budge. "'Tell my wife. She and our children must get to safety,' he whispered hoarsely. "'Tell them. They must all be brave.' "'You can tell them yourself when we get home,' Matt said. "'Just put your arms around my shoulders. We can make it home together.' But Master Hewson just closed his eyes. "'Tell them that they are everything to me, and that I love them.' His tar-blackened hand opened, and the cracked penny whistle he was gripping fell to the snowy ground. "'No, please,' Matt whispered. "'Please don't die.' Tears froze on Matt's cheeks in the icy night air. "'This wasn't supposed to happen. Thomas and Harry and the Patriots had wanted to change the world. But not like this. Not like this.' "'Halt! Who goes there?' a gruff voice called out in the dark. Two soldiers in red coats walked toward them. One held a lantern, while the other pointed his musket at Matt. Did someone see him exchange the button at the party? Had they sent a patrol to arrest him? Matt slid his hand into his pocket and once again gripped the button tightly in his hand. There was no time to run. He was trapped. Good God, man, one of the soldiers exclaimed when he saw Master Hewson. This must be the poor chap from Milk Street we heard about. The soldier looked at Matt. Did you see it happen, boy? Matt shook his head. I was working at the party down the street. The soldier sighed. Well, you better hurry home. These streets are not safe with the likes of such men who would do this to their own neighbor. We'll call for a wagon to pick up the body. His family will want him home. And a sad homecoming twill be, the other soldier said. Go on now, lad, and be off with you. Matt raced down the street. He had to get home before the soldiers found the coffin, coffin maker's wagon in front of the Houston's house. He and Thomas had to leave before they were discovered. Matt ran faster than he'd ever known he could. He was running for his life. Matt heard the coffin maker's wagon before he saw it. The loud clatter of wheels and horses' hooves was followed by the light of the lantern swinging through the dark. The wagon, piled high with coffins, came to a stop before the Houston's front door. The driver eyed Matt suspiciously. I thought there would be two of you, the driver rasped. There are two of us, Matt told him. Can you just wait while I go up and get the other one? I'll not risk waiting more than a few minutes, the driver warned. Matt raced toward the back door. He heard voices coming from the front rooms, but the kitchen was dark and empty. He took Katie's little pink flashlight out of his pocket and used it to find his way up the darkened stairway. He slipped back into the attic bedroom and was surprised to find Mistress Houston sitting on the bed beside Thomas. Her face was streaked with tears. "'Where were you, boy?' she asked. "'I... I...' Matt stammered. He looked at Thomas, but his eyes were closed and he didn't stir. "'I ran an errand for Thomas,' Matt finally said. "'It was something he needed.' "'What he needs now is rest in our prayers,' Mr. Susan said gravely. "'But we have to go,' Matt told her. "'The man with the wagon is waiting outside for us.' Matt took a step toward the bed. "'Thomas, you have to wake up!' he shouted. "'You have to wake up now!' Thomas moaned weakly, but he didn't open his eyes. Mistress Hewson grabbed Matt by the shoulder and pulled him away from the bed. 
For God's sake, boy, leave him be, she cried. They've taken my husband. God knows what they've done to him. And they killed my brother Harry. I'll not lose another to this war. You must go without him. I will see that no harm comes to him. Matt's heart sank as he stole a look back at the young spy, willing him to open his eyes. Do you know my brother well? Mistress Hewson asked. He's my friend, Matt whispered hoarsely. We had a plan. We were going to set the world right together. Oh, how I wish you had, Mistress Hewson murmured. How I wish you had. Matt tried to muster the courage to tell Mistress Hewson about her husband and to give her his message. You and your children must leave here at once, Matt began, for on my way here. But Mistress Hewson put a f her finger on Matt's lips to silence him. Shush now, lad, she said. My brother needs quiet. Let him rest. A horse whinnied impatiently outside the window, and Matt realized there was no time to waste. If he was going to get back to the mill, he would have to leave right now. Matt looked back at Thomas. His eyes opened slowly, and he motioned for Matt to come closer. "'Give us a moment, will you, Martha?' Thomas whispered. His sister stepped out of the room, and Matt approached the bed. "'Tell me,' Thomas said weakly. "'Were you successful?' Matt nodded. I have the button right here in my pocket. Thomas let out a sigh of relief. Good, lad. I knew you could do it. The wagon is waiting outside for us, Matt urged. We have to leave right now. But Thomas shook his head. Give the button to my men at the mill. They will know what to do with it. But what about you, protested Matt? The redcoats are coming. What if they find you here? Don't worry about me. You've still got the mission to complete. You must get out safely. Go now and take care, and guard that button with your life. I will, Matt promised, but please, can't you come with me? Thomas reached for Matt's hand and gave it a squeeze. I'm proud of you, Matthew. His breath was labored. Matthew. That's a good strong name you've got there, lad. His voice trailed off. A good, strong name. Mistress Hewson came back into the room and put her hand on Matt's shoulder. Leave him, son. He needs to rest now. Matt bolted out the door without looking back. He raced down the stairs and out to the street. The driver was standing next to his wagon. Where is he then? The driver demanded. I can't wait any longer. You don't need to, Matt said sadly. It's just going to be me. The driver climbed up into the wagon. He opened one of the long wooden boxes and waited for Matt to get in. Matt hesitated, but only for a second, for he could hear a distant clatter of wheels on cobblestones. Another wagon was coming down the street. Matt hurried into the coffin. The lid was closed, and with it came total darkness. The strong smell of fresh-cut pine filled his nose. Matt opened his eyes wide, hoping for any bit of light, straining to hear every sound. But sadness and panic seemed to be the only things to seep in. What if he had niche? What if he wanted to move? What if he needed more air? He tried to calm himself with thoughts of Hooter, Tony, and Q, and how happy they'd be to see him. But what would become of Thomas? Would he live? Would the Redcoats find him? The rest of the trip was a blur, being knocked up and down and fighting to hold his sadness and panic at bay, until the wagon finally bumped to a stop. When the driver lifted the coffin's lid, Matt took a long, deep breath of the cold, fresh air. He couldn't stand up fast enough. Once on the ground, he saw the familiar stone building with the large wooden water wheel at its side. Smoke poured out of the chimney, and the dust cake windows glowed from the firelight within. He was back at Sutton's Mill. Matt noticed a big, beautiful white horse tied up at a hitching post with eight other horses beside it. Whose were they, he wondered. The mill door opened and a rebel came out with Tony, Hooter, and Q following behind him. Hooter let out a loud whoop on seeing Matt. Tony couldn't stop talking. Q couldn't stop grinning. But where is Thomas, the rebel asked. He's at his sister's house on Milk Street, Matt said, biting his lip. He was hurt so badly, he couldn't make the trip. The man sighed loudly. How, he whispered. The redcoats? Yes, Matt told him. And they killed his brother, too. The man winced, as if he'd been slapped across the face. And the information Harry was to exchange... I made the exchange for him, Matt said. The man's eyebrow shot up. You, the man asked? He stared at Matt long and hard. 
You'd better come with me right away. Matt and the boys followed the man down the stairs to the mill's lower floor, which had recently been filled with cannons and guns. But the room was now empty, except for a table and some chairs. Two lamps burned brightly on the table. The smell of wood smoke rose from the bright flames in the grate. A tall, stately man was sitting before the hearth. In the firelight, Matt recognized the statuesque figure in the blue wool coat and buff trousers at once. He wore no wig, but his sandy brown hair was tied in a ponytail at the nape of his neck. His regal air and steady gaze were unmistakable. Matt knew that they were looking, once again, at General George Washington. The rebel approached the general and whispered something into his ear. The famous man shook his head, his face reddening. "'How many more fine young men will they cut down?' he shouted. He pounded the table with his fist. The room went deadly silent. The general stared into the fire. When he looked back up, his eyes fell on the boys. "'So which of you was the brave lad who attended a rather special party tonight?' he asked. "'I guess that would be me, sir,' Matt said. The famous man nodded. "'And I hear you came away with a small?' He cleared his throat and smiled slyly. "'Memento?' Matt continued to stare, too nervous to answer. Then he remembered the button. He took it out of his pocket, and with shaking hands, he passed it along to the famous leader. A small, well-dressed black man named William, who stood at the general's side, offered his knife, and General Washington used it to pry off the button's false bottom. He carefully worked the knife around the tiny, tightly rolled paper and lifted it out. Matt watched as he moved to the table and held the paper over the lit candle. Matt held his breath. A tense silence followed. Everyone's eyes were on the general and the paper in his hands. What did the words say, Matt wondered? Was it good news or bad? The general's face showed no emotion. Finally, after several long minutes, he looked up and said, in a slow, deliberate voice, They may have been dancing in Boston tonight, lads, but once they see the surprise we have in store for them, they won't be dancing for long. Thomas Jameson and his brother will not have fought in vain. The room erupted into cheers and loud huzzas from the men. "'Well done, lad,' the general smiled. "'Yes, sir,' Matt said. "'Thank you, sir.' "'Huzzah! Huzzah!' the men in the room all cried. "'Huzzah! Huzzah!' Hooter, Tony, and Q shouted, giving each other high fives. Matt beamed with pride. The general shook his hand. "'God willing, we will free Boston from the crown's grip, and our colonies will only grow stronger. You've done a good night's work, boy. Get some rest now.' For tomorrow, we'll surely test all our metal. Tomorrow, Matt mumbled. And you, young man, the general said, turning to Hooter. Are you a patriot as well? Oh, totally, Hooter said, throwing back his shoulders and standing as straight as he could. The general silently looked him over and eyed his shoes. Nice buckles, he said. Chapter 28 The Secret March "'Where are we going?' Matt asked the next morning as he and the boys were hustled into a cart with the men from the mill. "'Just do as you're told. The first stop is in the woods,' one of the rebels said. The boys spent the entire day helping the men gather tree limbs and logs in the forest and load them onto carts and wagons. They stopped only to take a drink of strong cider or a bite of oat cake. They were exhausted and starving. By sundown, the four friends were on the road with large bundles of branches strapped to their backs.' They followed behind a long line of wagons and horses, silently moving over the frozen ruts. It was slow going. The wagon's wheels were wrapped with straw to deaden their sound, and they were so top-heavy with wood, stone, and cannons that they threatened to topple over at every turn. General Washington had ordered that no lamps were to be used and no fires lit. No one was to speak above a whisper. The farther they walked, the more wagons they met. Hundreds of men and boys seemed to appear under the bright moonlight, their heads bent low, their backs laden with bundles of straw and wood. After several hours trudging up a rocky hillside in the bitter cold, everyone came to a stop. As Matt and the boys waited for orders, they blew into their hands, which were raw and red from the cold. "'Where are we?' Hooter whispered. "'We're at the top of Georgester Heights,' a young stranger said, slipping a bundle of birch saplings off his back." At the mention of Dorchester, Matt felt a wave of goosebumps spread over his skin, and he and the boys exchanged uneasy glances. The roar of cannon fire suddenly sounded from the distance. "'What's that?' Tony cried. 
I'll wager it's the cannon fire of Boston's own Henry Knox, a man beside them said with a smile. He and our comrades in Roxbury are sending their greetings to the Redcoats in Boston. Couldn't they just send a postcard, Hooter whispered? It sounds awfully co close, Matt whispered back as the bombardment continued. Don't worry, tis a good diversion, the man assured them. But Matt was worried. What if the fighting got closer? What if a cannonball came crashing straight at them? Worse still, where were the girls? What if they were hit by rebel cannon fire? The redcoats will start firing back on our men soon, another man said. Say a prayer they missed their marks. And say another that Hal doesn't send his thousands of troops up here after us. What would happen then, Tony asked. It would be a slaughter, the man said grimly. A bloody slaughter. Matt felt his knees go weak. He nodded to his friends, and the four huddled close. If only we knew what was going to happen next, Matt whispered to Q. If only we knew if we won or lost at Dorchester. Don't look at me, Q said, shaking his head sadly. You guys are the ones who wanted to throw marshmallows at army men rather than read a book. Remember? I have no idea what will happen next. If only we had the book with us now, said Matt. If only we had the marshmallows with us now, Hooter sighed. They trudged on, scared and exhausted, until suddenly the order came down, passing a whisper from one man to the other. Begin emptying the wagons. Make haste, but make no noise. And any man who makes a fire will be shot. Matt and the boys followed the men's lead and began silently carting wood, straw, stones, and sand-filled barrels from the wagons to the hillside's frozen ledges. Others worked together to build up breastworks and to position barrels, rocks, and cannons. The last wagon was not emptied until dawn. Matt stood with the others, exhausted and yet exuberant as they marveled at the work they had done. For the entire hillside was now ringed with mounds of rock and birch timber, each top with one of Henry Knox's cannons, all pointing down at the king's transports in the harbor. Rows of barrels were ready to roll down upon any who dared to attack. It looked like the work of tens of thousands. "'What do you suppose General Hal will do when he wakes up and sees this?' Q whispered to a soldier. "'He'll either attack within the hour, hour or he'll wait for the cover of night,' the soldier answered. "'Which was it?' the four boys wondered miserably. "'If only they'd read Q's book!' Matt and the boys hunkered down under the cover of a wagon's tarp. There they waited with the others all day. Everyone's ears pricked up as they listened for the sound of a bugle, the beat of a drum, or the sudden roar of cannon fire. But the only guns they heard were in the distance. That night, a fierce winter storm blew across Boston and blanketed the heights with snow and freezing rain. Wintry blasts off the Atlantic continued to howl all through the next day. Tony couldn't stop his teeth from chattering. Q complained that his fingers were growing numb. Matt moaned he couldn't feel his toes. Hooter was so hungry that even the idea of eating a moldy oat cake sounded good to him. They were all beginning to think they'd freeze to death when suddenly they heard someone shout, Hal will not attack! He has given orders to evacuate! The redcoats are leaving! The redcoats are leaving! Hooter threw off the tarp and together the boys leaped to their feet to join in the boisterous chorus of cheers that broke out at the news. General Washington's plan had worked! The rebels had built such a strong fortification in one night that General Hal's guns couldn't reach over the breastworks. Meanwhile, the English ships in the harbor were in the direct line of fire. Hal and his men were backing down and would soon be on the run. A familiar tall figure in blue and buff suddenly appeared on a magnificent white seed. Everyone's eyes were on him as he slowly crossed the hillside. Then the general took off his hat and waved it to the men and boys who had worked so valiantly for him. "'Well done, men! Well done!' General Washington cried. A deafening cheer rose up and echoed over the hills. "'Huzzah! Huzzah! Huzzah! Three cheers for Ger General Washington! Three cheers for our good general!' Everyone laughed and cried with joy. Hooter lifted Tony up off his feet and twirled him in the air. "'So now we know what happened at Dorchester,' Q said with a grin. "'Yeah, we sure do,' Matt agreed. "'Now all we have to do is find Katie and the twins.' And away home, Tony added. Home. The word lingered in the air. Home. <laughs>